Good evening. Although I kind of want to say live from Troy, New York, it's uh, it's an old it's an older people joke for SNL. Uh, good evening. My name is Michael Zwack, uh, class of 2011, and a member of the Rensselaer Alumni Association Board of Trustees. On behalf of the RAA and the Office of Alumni Engagement, I just want to welcome all of you, uh, in person or uh, on on the web, to the Hefner Alumni House, and to the beginning of our three-part series speaker series on what entrepreneurs need to know about venture capital. This series is part of a networking program by the RAA called Connections, providing alumni and students in-person and virtual opportunities to engage on topics that are strategic focus of RPI and the RAA. To allow those conversations to reach our entire community, we recommend, if you have not yet, to join RAA Connect a, which is a networking platform and mobile app built exclusively for Rensselaer alumni, alumnae, and students. RAA Connect brings our community together with access to easy-to-use alumni directory, featuring powerful search filters, and the most current career information that allows you to connect with alumni around the world in community groups like entrepreneurship and venture capital. Information to join RAA Connect is available on our alumni website. We're very excited to have what we know will be a very engaging conversation on how someone creates the idea, assesses the opportunity, determines partners and funding, and has that one last reality check before taking the plunge. Uh, during the event registration, we did receive a few questions submitted. Uh, for those that have questions during tonight's conversation, uh, if you're in person, we have some QR codes on your seats and high tops. And for those attending remotely, uh, we've emailed that to you uh, in a link a few minutes ago. And we'll try and address a few of those at the end of our evening's event. So let's get into introducing tonight's speaker, Toby Saulnier, RPI class of 1984, 1989, and 1994 PhD. After earning all of those degrees from RPI in electrical engineering, Toby led a successful career in R&D in, in embedded and distributed systems at General Electric Research and Development, earning 16 patents along the way. Following that time at GE, Toby then oversaw product development at Vicarious Visions, managing a team of over 100 artists, engineers, designers, project managers, delivering over 30 game titles to markets, from Blue's Clues to Doom 3. She then went on to become the founder and CEO of First Playable Productions, which is a game development studio, studio located right here in Troy, New York. And First Playables was the, the, actually the first certified B Corp company in New York's Tech Valley. And that's a company that's been verified to meet high standards of social and environmental performance, transparency, and accountability. And it was actually the first game development studio to receive that certification in the entire United States. Toby's written articles in dozens of professional publications and is frequently on uh, speaker circuits um, uh, talking on topics really ranging from kid testing, IP rights, to the application of new software processes to improve industry quality of life through structured planning and development processes. On top of all of this, Toby was the 2018 William F. Glasser Class of 1953 Entrepreneur of the Year. And for those that don't know, uh, this year's ceremony is this Friday. Um, so without further delay, please let's welcome Toby Sonia. And how many of you here are students, current students? Awesome. So I'll just subtract out the ones that didn't raise their hand. <laughs> I'm going to do a talk sitting down. I don't know that I've ever done this before, but it'll keep me still because otherwise the camera would never be able to keep talking. So um, nice to be here tonight. Oh, and so the name of the talk is Taking, Taking the Plunge. And I think the, the thing that um, sets me apart from some other entrepreneurs and certainly from some RPI graduates is that I did go and work at GE um, Research for about 13 years before I even joined the small business community. And then after five years there, that's when I decided to go and start my own company. So I kind of went from a really large company and then just kind of leapt off the cliff into the unknowns of a 
little company where, in a big company like GE, you can blame Jack Welch for anything that you don't like that's going on in a little company. You only have yourself to blame. So, um, First Playable Productions um, is a video game company. has been in downtown Troy um, since 2006. We started in the Incubator Center. Um, we develop games for mobile, console, web, um, VR now. Um, since COVID, we have remote employees in seven states in addition to New York, so the workplace has changed quite dramatically. Um, and the company turned 18 last um, April 1st. April Fool's Day is our um, birthday. And we actually started at the incubator center across the parking lot from here and were there for about a year when we were just starting up um, back in the day. And we make games for all platforms, like I had mentioned. Um, we do, we focus on two different mar markets. One is the entertainment market, and that's with clients like Disney, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, um, but also my passion has always been to bring video game technology into applied games and games like education and healthcare, which I'll talk more about. Um, but that means that we have a pretty diverse um, set of projects, I think more so than, I actually don't know any other developer who attempts to do both of those things at the same time. Um, this, this, this talk is intended to be about the beginning of First Playable and actually taking that plunge to begin with. So I went back and looked at our company mission um, just to remind myself of that. And actually a lot of it still applies, um, including one thing that stood out to me is the multi-generational play because we just did a game where I was doing an interview and really focusing on that aspect. And, and somebody said, it's like, is that something new, multi-generational play? I'm like, no, it's like fundamental, but I didn't realize it's actually part of our original mission <laughs> page that we had back then. Actually, if I compare, the main difference is that we don't focus as much just on young kids. Like when we started out, we were really focused on young kids, 12 and under, um, and our audience has gotten much more broad, we realize there are a lot more audiences that don't have game developers who are wanting to make games for them. Um, so that's been the main difference. Most of the other things um, with our mission, and of course our mission statement changed as well because the previous one was very focused on educational games and we're less focused on edu educational games specifically, but there's so many other ways that you can use game technology and education is just one of them. Um, our very first game that we finished was Cabbage Patch Kids. It's kind of ironic because it's actually a local product, Cabbage Patch Kids. And uh, that's the game we finished first um, on the Game Boy Advance. Back in 2006 is when it, we finished it. And we just finished Pickleball Smash. So I hope there's some pickleball players here <laughs> because you would appreciate this game. Multi it's a multi-platform console game. is kind of the opposite in many ways in terms of complexity of the types of games we started making when we were just a, a startup company. So there, there was a lot that happened in between um, during those 18 years. Um, 2005 is when we started making Cabbage Patch Kids. So um, quite the span of experience. And so how we all started, there's an incubator center. There's a picture of us in um, a, of office, which was actually, I rented an office that I actually worked in as a student at RPI. Um, Intermagnetics had rented that office previously, and I was a student intern, I would have to say, probably not a very good uh, student intern, because I spent most of my time confused about what I was supposed to be doing, but that's part of being a student. Um, so that, um, we kind of started that April Fool's Day in 2005, but it started before that as well. Um, I was uh, RPI, um, RPI student, and I was working at GE part-time. I certainly didn't take the speedy path through school. Um, actually, when I got my undergrad, I said I was never going back to school, and then a year later, I was um, asking to be <laughs> admitted back into the graduate program because I realized I hadn't learned very much in my years here, too much time on hockey line and other things. And then I spent time at GE and, and then a Vicarious Visions. So my business path really went very much from um, a large business to small business. And, um, and that was uh, made easier by the fact that I had been working almost a second full-time volunteer job at the Woodland Hill Montessori School where I was on the board um, very early. I think in probably, 
I don't know, soon, within five years of starting at GE, I was on this um, board for over 10 years. And there was quite a difference in my experience going from GE where you had an HR department, a finance department, you had everybody, all these departments taking care of everything. And then going to this very small school, I had about eight staff when I joined, where you just realized that there, you had to do everything yourself. I just remember how shocking it was when I first got involved and we were losing money and I was becoming the treasurer. I had to learn what accrual meant and all these finances stuff that I didn't really need to know at GE. And so the positive benefit of that is being involved in that school, besides realizing the importance of community service, because it's unpaid board members like myself that help um, organizations like that, was, was just being better prepared when I joined Vicarious Visions for the fact that you don't have anybody, you don't really have nobody else doing stuff for you. You have to do it all by yourself. Um, so this is GE Research, a global business. Um, you know, very well known, used to do better than it's doing now, and I worked at the research center. So I did research, um, which is to say we didn't have real deadlines. We weren't delivering products. We were working with the businesses, trying to help them with products, but um, none of the projects I had had, um, you know, what I would now call a real deadline. Um, so I mentioned that in part because when I then joined the uh, well, then I, this is just bringing up the Montessori School. One of the outcomes of the Montessori School experience is that we ended up being able to build our own building. And that was through trying to apply just a tiny fraction of all the process and discipline I learned at GE and trying to apply that to the school to try to get our books in order, actually collect our tuition for the invoice we sent out, um, try to actually make a little more money than we spent every year. And ultimately, um, we're able to build a school building. And then I got to have the benefit of you know, dropping my kids off at that school for years and appreciating both the benefit of community service and how schools and other community organizations depend on you know, people working for free to make these resources available, but just also understanding better just all the economic components of a small business. Everything you have to do between payroll and you know, operations issues of you know, what color paint do you get and how do you clean this thing and how do you deal with upset parents or um, conflicts that might arise between your clients and your staff. Um, so that, that was a great introduction to that small business and gave me a lot of um, passion and appreciation for the benefit of that. So then when I joined Vicarious Visions, um, I jumped into the business of video games. I knew nothing about video games um, at GE. I worked on the 13 business units. I worked with all of them, uh, locomotives, um, X-ray machines. I, one of the last projects I did was with the automated meter reading venture that we had. Um, before that, I was working on automated boil detection on stoves that would automatically notice when your pot came to a boil. So basically, a lot of technology, nothing involving art. <laughs> There's no art involved. I was considered a good artist for an engineer there because I could draw stick figures. Um, and certainly no game design. And I played Pac-Man, but I really hadn't played video games. So when I joined Vicarious Visions, it was quite the um, introduction of, into an entirely new market. And believe it or not, when I joined, I was like, could I really stay interested in one product? I'm used to GE, there's 13 different businesses, I'm always learning something new. And I hadn't appreciated yet that in video games, it just changes constantly out from under you. There's nothing that's gonna be the same. You think you've figured out all the platforms and the technology, and four years later, it's different. So there's no opportunity to be bored in video games, despite my initial um, misgivings. Toby, and, how yeah. did you make that turn from GE to Vicarious? Like, what, what encouraged that? Oh, that's a good question. I'm glad you um, asked that. So what happened at um, GE Research is that we were going through some, what you would call reduction in force with Jack Welch, where he had this approach of totem pulling, where everything, um, you lined everybody up um, in order in their level of importance, and then you cut off the bottom 10%. <laughs> and, and the way that GE um, did that, they did that to every organization. So the lab I was in with 100 people, we had to fire 10 people. And I, um, um, after one of those sessions, I was, in tears because I had people in my group, a bunch of introverted engineers that had ended up just above that bottom 10%. And I just, I just didn't have it in me <laughs> to, to be able to do that. And so I felt like I was getting nothing accomplished. At the same time, I had some friends that had left GE and started Global Spec and started some other businesses. So I'm like, there, you know, John's going out there and he's getting this accomplished and you can actually do something. Look what, at the school, a little bit of time, what I could 
accomplish and the good I can accomplish, you know, maybe I should just leave um, the big company because I'm not, I'm not even protecting my, my own people. I'm not getting anything accomplished. So I had this moment of um, vulnerability, went to see a friend who was leaving, and he convinced me to talk to this little video game company. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, de I'm depressed right now, but I'll get over it. And he's like, oh, you should talk to them. They're really interesting. So he twisted my arm to go talk to them. And, uh, and that was very interesting. And the, and the Balas had a great vision, and I was very intrigued by that. And I, I just made the leap. But that in itself was a hard leap to make because I was leaving the, what seemed like the security of a large company to this, this tiny little, um, you know, they're very, they, I was a VP of product development. They didn't have any processes. They weren't really keeping track of who was working on which projects. They just started barely getting um, actual contracts. So it was a completely night or day. And I was VP of product development. I had never delivered anything on time before, <laughs> but they didn't appreciate that there's all this GE process. You have all this discipline. You have all this knowledge. Um, but underneath, I was very aware that I had better figure out how to deliver something on time because if I didn't, this company was gonna be in trouble and it was gonna be my fault because I was accepting a job for something I didn't know how to do yet. But you know, that's good to have pressure on yourself to learn that stuff super quick. Um, I had to learn how to play games. We were making a Spider-Man game. I couldn't play the game. And I remember my son watching me try to play the game. I told my husband, I was like, this is homework. I have to figure out how to fight Rhino. And my son would be like, that's okay, mom. You can do better next time. And so <laughs> Kind of a great learning experience. And, and Blue's Clues was an eye-opening experience because that was the first year and there were people at the company who didn't really want to do games for very young children. But I had a three-year-old in Montessori and I was like, this is amazing. This is like you can do an educational game with a video game and accomplish everything you do in a Montessori classroom. But on, on the game, it's um, fantastic. But what I had to learn is how to work with a licensor, how to work with Nickelodeon. Um, I had to learn some of the language of art and design. Um, and I was really thanks to that project that I got a chance to learn that because it would be really hard to do now with the size of projects these days to get up that learning curve if you didn't start out in video games. So um, from there, Vicarious Visions, we were successful enough that um, Vicarious Visions was acquired by Activision, and so then I was in a position of deciding what I wanted to do next because at that point I was in love with working with a small community-based business and I was a little devastated about the acquisition because obviously I didn't have a financial interest in it. And so I was just like, what do I do now? I could go back to GE, that was kind of a blast, but it seems boring now. Um, and then I, I could go work at a game publisher like Activision, but that's going back to the corporate world and, um, and I'd already worked with publishers and I didn't feel that they were far enough in the human resources department to, to become a manager and a game publisher. Um, so I was trying to, and I'm passionate about education, but I don't think I have the skill set to be an educator. And so I was trying to decide what to do, and I um, realized there was a gap um, as Vicarious Visions. There was, the, I realized there were, uh, was a need for people who actually wanted to make games for young kids, um, that actually wanted to make that, weren't just doing this stepping stone that was actually what they were passionate about. Um, and people who um, saw the power of the media beyond entertainment, so they saw how it could be used for education. Um, also, I had learned that um, Vicarious Visions um, I'd, I'd seen through our experience there, there's not that many developers that could do high quality on a tight schedule. And Vicarious Visions was going to be working for only Activision, so I knew there was going to be immediately a gap there. And uh, the other thing I was worried about is um, there's only one game company in this area. And I knew from my corporate involvement at GE, this is just like insight into the window of what, what makes me tick because I just worry about people. But I was like, oh no, because now they're going to have layoffs because when you become part of a large corporation, the management is like, hire a ton of people and now you got to downsize. And I was like, well, then nobody, there's no other choice in this region. If there's layoffs in this region, there's not another game company, people will have to move out of the region. And so, um, and so it's kind of like, egotistical on my part to think that I could like build another game company quick enough to make a difference. But we did ultimately hire people that were laid off from Vicarious Visions um, later on a few years later. So it did ultimately, and obviously we're not never a big enough company to do, to do have a big impact, but we did start the snowball rolling and now there's numerous game companies in the area. But that was very motivating um, to me as you can imagine because I left, Vic left GE because I didn't like the layoffs um, there so that I was going to have to do to my team.
Um, and then I had a lot of encouragement. I just had people um, just encourage me just to do it. And I think that made a big difference as well. Nintendo gave me the license before I even had the company form. So there were a lot of people out there who were just like, go try it. So I keep that in mind when people are trying to get something started and try to make sure I provide that encouragement as well. Because if you don't try, you'll always wonder if you, you should have tried. So I, I'm a big believer in just giving it a shot. And I appreciated having people tell me that when I was at that stage. So I kind of took the leap and just kind of jumped off like this blissful little penguin here. Um, and then there's that issue of like, well, wait a minute, um, <laughs> maybe that's not going to go so well. Um, so there's a lot of, I knew from my time at GE, one of the things I did was I went around, did training on how to use Six Sigma process for new product development, um, which is just trying to have more discipline and care when you're introducing new products across, uh, across GE. So I, I was doing training across the US and in Europe, working with all of the different businesses about a more structured process to get some data before you plunge in and start making a product that turns out isn't needed. So I knew from that experience that most of these efforts fail. And so I had a long list of, of things that I, I could go wrong. Like there's most of the time you're going to miss the target, your market's wrong, you execute incorrectly. And I knew since I um, led this the Six Sigma for marketing, um, I taught a bunch of tools to use to, to increase your chances of success. So of course I use those tools. Because um, I'm like, I don't want to fail. I'm going to grab my little toolbox that I've been doing facilitation of and actually start applying it. I already applied it both at Vicarious Visions and the, the Montessori School because it's filled with tools that me as an engineer loves. Like, first of all, the four block diagram. Awesome. Post-it notes. I'm a huge lover of post-it notes. I don't know how to do that remotely anymore. But um, uh, Excel. I love Excel and the C CTQs and, and, uh, and just like managing things and taking and surveying people and getting data um, from people. So I, I grabbed that toolbox. Um, I started at the incubator. I think I just showed up on like April 1st and just like, here, uh, I think this is where I started a company. And they, were, they sent me as like, you have to come up with a business plan first. And I'm like, okay, well, I got this tool set. I'm going to go figure out my business plan. So um, one of the things that I, I use a lot and I use then and I used for first playable was called a fishbone diagram. It's something engineers use a lot, which is the idea of like, oh, you have a set of things, it's not super artistic, but the idea is like, if, you're, if you fill these out in kind of iterative fashion, you start to flesh out your, your skeleton of what your, your plan is. And, and the tool set kind of has tools on each one of these 10 different areas, and you kind of do first passes of each of those, and then, um, and then you have kind of the beginnings of a business plan, and you can do some risk assessment. So the, the things that you start with first, oh, and I should say, before I get into all this, which is going to look like a lot of like super analytical thinking, and sometimes people will say you're an analytical thinker, but actually you're, I'm an intuitive thinker who tries to find the analytical backup to what my intuition is. So obviously, it's not just the tools. I already had a strong intuition of what was needed, right? So the point of the tools is try to enrich your thinking, try to find gaps, and get you to focus on the things that um, maybe don't come as naturally to you. So I already obviously had a bit of a um, clear intuition of what I thought would be needed, but I hadn't really done, you know, all the homework to make sure I would be more successful. Um, so um, the first thing I look at is the opportunity. Um, so the target opportunity was the established market that I had learned um, and I was convinced had um, had a need for a developer that could do better than the other developers out there. And then I had this longer term market of education. Um, or as used to be called edutainment um, for the PC, um, golden age of PC edutainment, which is like Oregon Trail and Broderbund and a bunch of um, wonderful games that then just got oversaturated and the whole um, PC ROM market fell to pieces. But I, I thought those games had a lot of potential and these new, these new platforms would offer a more mobile opportunity because kids get dragged everywhere. Um, they have to wait and wait, wait at doctor's office, wait for their older sibling. And if we could turn those waiting moments into learning moments, I thought there was a huge opportunity there, but it wasn't actually a market yet. So for like a lot of startups, you, sh you need to have to wait to actually a market that you know exists, that can, especially if you're bootstrapping, and then you have the market that you're kind of aspiring to and aiming for that might evolve by the time you get to it. Right, and that, I mean, so, that was what your original charter was, kid, right? And yes, you, you know, the company, even from day one, was the idea of taking, oh, well, there's this um, fun 
you know, hard work, but fun work in making entertainment games, but if we can transfer that knowledge into educational games, um, we definitely want to keep the same age audience at that time, um, because working for younger kids was not something that a lot of developers did, and it develops, you have to develop play testing, you have to develop uh, intuition, you have to find staff who are actually excited about that. Some developers would rather work on games that they themselves want to play, and I had to find the people who want to make games for other people. And it, I know when I started the company, I was like, I'm over 40 years old, I'm starting this company, I bet I only have this opinion because I'm a mom. Um, but sure enough, there were actual college students graduating who also were motivated to make games for people other than themselves and make games for kids. Um, so that was a, kind of a unifying component of, of those two efforts. And, you know, and really, I think, affected a lot of our strategy. We've just started to become more diverse because there's other audiences, like older audiences that we serve now. Did you have to do research? for that strategy? I mean, obviously, financing and everything else comes later, but to, to kind of double check the gut reaction that you had in that. Avenue. Yeah, the, um, to be fair in the, um, where I was going, I uh, back here, with the, with the emerging opportunity, I was, uh, I took more of an evangelist approach. <laughs> <laughs> which, I mean, is a choice. You just have to, there wasn't any near-term opportunity at that time. Eventually, we did have educational game projects, and we um, had a very long and fruitful relationship with LeapFrog Entertainment until they self-destructed, um, which was a great experience. But at the time that I was talking about this, this was kind of um, not considered to be you know, a real market, so it was just like, it was an idea. So you have the, your main thing that you're gonna build your business on, and then you have your, your you know, what you really wanna do and evangelize, but, um, but you have to be very agile because um, you'll have to adapt to what actually the opportunities end up being. Um, so I, we did actually do some Nintendo DS educational ga games, so they did exist there, and I do believe a lot of our clients on the entertainment space were motivated by our interest in educational games. I do think there's some symbiotic relationship there where both of those are beneficial. And then I had my Montessori um, training background, which helped a lot in terms of just understanding child development and the different brain at that age, which helps make a you know, better design and, and serve that audience better if you have that. And that, that I learned with my side job, so volunteer everybody is a great way to uh, to learn stuff, <laughs> business stuff. Um, so then the next thing, once we kind of had a target, and then um, this is another awesome model, the five forces model, um, which I used to teach lots of marketing people across TE because you end up in marketing not because you were trained, but because somebody told you to go do it. <laughs> so a lot of people didn't have basic marketing training. So five forces model is just a way to say, all right, stop and think about your, your industry. What does your industry look like? What's the balance of power? Um, and, you know, it's, and it's a very simple model, but then when you apply it to, and I'd already seen this in GE, when you apply it to a specific product, you're like, that doesn't look anything like the five forces model, but the basic principles remain. Um, in the game industry, there's a few large publishers. That's still the case. The publishers tend to be very large. They have all the bargaining power. The contracts we sign are extremely one-sided contracts. And if you want to be a game developer, that's just what you're going to have to deal with and appreciate that and kind of choose between the publishers. Um, EA, for instance, was a was a horrible publisher to deal with because they had like a net 90 <laughs> payment terms. Like, how can you survive with net 90? Um, then you had your platform providers. They're just as powerful um, platform providers still today. Um, there's now Apple, Google Play. Then it was Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft. Um, they create little monopolistic ecosystems that they can entirely control. And um, they get the revenue from, and you have to work within the, their bounds. You have to get their approvals. You have to. Um, compete for whichever the market they're going to let you compete for. But in some ways, for a game developer, that was great because it created barriers to entry um, for Nintendo and even Sony and Microsoft today. They've changed their strategy a little bit to accommodate independent developers, but for larger titles, you still have to like beat down the doors <laughs> and let them let you in. I still have this problem today because when they change platforms, you have to update your certifications. Um, so th it's annoying to deal with, but what I've learned is anything that's hard and difficult that you have to face in business is probably a barrier to entry. So you can be pretty annoyed about having to go and deal with that and fight through that, but then you have to keep in mind that everybody else will also have to do that. So um, now I have, you know, the appreciation is like, well, even though I'm complaining about it or I'm annoyed 
together. I have to fill out all this documentation. That's one, that's something that's going to help me in business because it'll keep down the amount of competition, which if you have too much competition, that depresses prices and that depresses wages and has all those other negative side effects. Um, and then there, you could go directly to consumers. So we've already, always made games for consumers, but we were not usually selling them directly. On occasion, we've had an exception to that, like our Chateauetry game with William Shatner was a direct-to-consumer um, game. But usually we haven't been at a scale that we would be able to manage um, the distribution, the marketing, not, let alone the inventory risk um, of, of games. So we manage the software risk, but we would always be looking to publish it, to manage the inventory risk, which is all the stuff you have to buy and put in a warehouse and then get rid of it at some point if it doesn't sell. Um, and then you, and the next thing I'd look at would be which, which customers, which um, you have your market of game publishers, but which game publishers? We, we, you know, in order to be effective, we have to narrow down on publishers that are a good fit for what we're going to provide. Um, so um, when I was looking at that, we um, looking at publishers, not, not business to consumer directly, although that's a big part of game industry now, but that was not our focus when we started out. And, um, and younger kids, so specifically publishers who were aimed at younger kids and ones who had um, big licenses with Disney, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, that they had to achieve a certain standard because you might license a popular pro a property, but those large companies are, are, have very high standards, are very particular about making sure everything is done um, at the top level. Um, so those publishers need to have a very competent developer to be able to make these licensors happy that we're treating their brand appropriately. And also we still have to deliver on time because either the movie's coming out and you can't be late for the movie, you're gonna miss your sales, or Christmas um, doesn't get postponed. So what took LeapFrog down ultimately is one of their products they couldn't deliver in time for Christmas and it pretty much um, wiped out their company. So, um, so Christmas is a pretty big deal. Um, game developers are often, I, I think of us as the elves who are our busy season is in the summer when we're like working away, making all the toys and that's when our long, long evenings and our occasional weekends would come into play and then we get done with our work and then it goes on to manufacturing. People are like working extra time and then it goes to retail, all those people working lots of times through the holiday hours so we can all buy stuff. And then the accountants get to work the extra time in January, February, March, going to tax season. Um, and then handheld um, platforms with the other segmentation, um, because those are just really hard to work on. And I knew that from embedded systems at GE. And I want to work on things that are hard to work on, because people will work for free for everything else. <laughs> so you got to find a market where people aren't going to do the work for free, um, which is a big issue in the game industry, because a lot of people will make games for free. Um, so, and then I, of course, analyze the competition, and this is another step that is easy to overlook, um, but the competition is very important to have a good eye on. So there's, there's two reasons for that. One is that competition is who you're going to be competing with for those clients, um, but there are going to be different types of competition, and, and one type of competition is the competition of um, people that are very similar to yourself. And what I um, had learned at GE is the term coopetition, um, which I found to be very useful in games. So this, uh, it's the, cl the competition that's most similar to yourself. Um, you guys have the biggest stake together to preserve your, your segment of the pie for high quality games that are going to come out on time on these difficult platforms. So over the years, those competitors, um, we've helped each other out a lot because we're trying to do games that actually pay us enough to you know pay a living wage to people and we're trying to keep out the competition who is underpricing or or not doing quality work so when i was starting first playable competitors gave me equipment um, they let me hang out with them at conferences <laughs> gave me advice on signing deals and these were people that we were basically competing head to head but if we can create enough opportunity there's plenty of it for all of us because we're not going to one one team's not going to be able to take all the all the um, projects so if one person wins one well then we'll get the next one so um, as long as we can create a demand for our product um, so then the oh the next thing that um, is pretty critical in the process and it is constantly evolving because the market's evolving is this concept of market needs so I I, I'm pretty active in the local angel network and I've seen a lot of business pitches and I'm very active in the community and often like a lot of people like myself um, get very focused on a technology and a solution and we, we try to push it 
into the market and get frustrated because they won't buy the thing that we made. Um, and I certainly experienced that at GE because a lot of my favorite technologies were not ultimately accepted. <laughs> so we're still using Ethernet even though it is not the best. But um, regardless, what the market analysis lets you do is kind of look at things from the other side is what, what are you providing that the market actually needs and wants and um, and there's this lovely four block diagram is saying, you know, what are the things that you're providing that are must haves? You have to have it because all your competition is going to have it. You have to provide this. And then what are the things that you can figure out that um, people aren't providing yet? So a great example um, that I always think of is the post-it note. Um, you know, there was no post-it note when 3M came out with that product. It was immediately absorbed and um, everybody loved it because what had everybody been doing? Tearing up little pieces of paper and sticking them <laughs> onto things. But somebody was smart enough to realize, you know, oh, there's this need, there's no product, but we can see people improvising. That's one of the great um, signs of a needed product is that humans are very inventive. And if we have a need, we'll tend to like jury rig something together and we'll have some solutions is kind of solving the thing because I don't have a product yet and if you can be attentive to that and see what people are doing you can you know try to figure out what that unmet unmet need is and then there's the part where you have a unique thing but nobody wants it so that's just that, that upper left category which often in the research world we would have things like that um, all right, so our unmet need um, was game developers who were actually um, informed and interested in making games for young kids and the different brains that they present. Um, for top entertainment brains, you know, brands, a, a team that can actually do um, artwork to the level that a Disney, Pixar, et cetera, would, um, would love and be delighted with. Um, under tight schedule constraints, because there's no, if we're making a software product, but we can't be part of the 90% of software products that are late. Um, we have to be the 10% which are on time. And then we had some must-haves. We had to be licensed by the platforms um, that we were on, and we had to, you know, manage risk. Um, you know, in some, in some ways, managing the software risk could be seen as unmet need, but the market didn't really need it because we were signing fixed price contracts, so we were in trouble if we didn't manage the budget. It was our own money that we would have to spend, but, but it was a, a need for trying to stay in business. So right when we started out, we really focused on software process, software quality, which the game industry, you know, historically hadn't embraced. I found a lot of resistance to adopting those processes um, in my previous um, work at Vicarious Visions, I, they did ultimately adopt some, but it was through some painful experiences. And so from day one at First Playable, we had code reviews, we had software processes, we had an auto build system, we had things that could help us manage what our biggest risk was going to be, which was not being able to manage our software. Um, and then we do um, the SWOT analysis, which some of you may have heard before. Um, if, if you have taken any management classes, but that's looking at your strengths and weaknesses and then opportunities and threats. But strengths and weaknesses are the most valuable part. And this is useful at every level, individually, your team, if you're going after a proposal, looking at your competitors and trying to line up um, your strengths with your competitor's weakness. Um, so, I had strengths. Um, I had. I was came into starting first playable with a lot of strengths that benefited us hugely because I had all these relationships. Um, actually, ironically, I thought some of our strongest relationships. I thought they wouldn't like me because I was the one who would tell them we wouldn't be able to do the project that we had just signed on that schedule within that budget. I'm like, oh, I was always the person bringing them the problem. But I realized um, one of our first, our first project, Cabbage Patch Kids game, came from someone who I felt I just disappointed in the project I had most recently done with them at the other studio. But what, what I realized later is what people appreciated was how we communicated the issues, how we solved the issues, and it wasn't just whether or not you had issues, because every project has issues, every game project um, has issues, more how you resolve those issues. So, so that was, um, there were many strengths on there. Um, I had some savings I was willing to put into starting the company. My aunt had passed away, and so I had like this like money, like oh, I guess I could use that. And um, I knew how to make games. I learned, I've been a good student. I learned all this stuff. My big downside is I didn't have a team. 
<laughs> was kind of a negative. Um, and, I, and I had a plan. I was like, oh, well, we have all those little competitors that are these small person teams, so I can use my relationships to get projects, and then I'll, and then I'll work with these remote teams to do those, to do those projects. And um, ironically, that approach probably would fly today. Um, but back when I w was conceiving of it, I was like, oh, I just need an office and the incubator for like two people maybe. You know, that's maybe the most we need. Um, because I need to solve this team. When did that team. start? When did you get the office? When did you hire the first staff? Like, um, how did that progress? Yeah, I, I think I moved in around April 1st. And then the, this next thing, I had my plan. And I went and talked to some of my potential clients, those relationships, and they were like, you know, what is your plan? And um, because they're basically, I, I wouldn't hire you. Like, where's your team? I need to visit your team. So I realized um, I started April 1st. By the second week, of, second week of April, I realized my whole business plan was at least the tactical part of how I'm going to do it. I had to throw it out and rethink the whole thing. Um, so uh, at that point, I realized it's like, Oh, I actually need to have a team on site. There was like this thing called the four T's, um, which I picked up. You need to have your talent. They need to be a team that's established and they are, you can prove they already know how to work together. Like, I don't even have a team. So, and you have to be able to like prove this. So I was like, okay, so I know to do a project, I need about 12 people. I've got to hire 12 people. Um, and, um, you know, I have to hire them by, I guess, June. I have to get them on board. We have to do a demo that can show that we can do this level quality work to do basically what you call it a vertical slice right now. So we took a Disney property. Um, I had to find 12 people, which is just a number I came up with. I had my eight-year-old son um, put a lot of pressure on me to force me to make this work because he was eight years old. He thinks mom can do everything. So everyone he met, he's like, yeah, mom's going to hire like 12 people and we're going to be having a team over at RPI and all this like don't tell people, I don't know if I can do this, but now my son is telling everybody, now I feel like there's some pressure. So he would come and help make the desk for these 12 people. And then we just kind of rambled around campus and tracked a few people down. Um, and then we went to some IGDA meetings and found a few more people. And then a, a, a small number of people left by Carrie's Visions, which was awesome because I had um, experience. I had like three experienced people. A couple people that were, you know, people who had not worked there, had not met the target there, but for my company, they were perfect. Um, so really, when you're, when you're working at a company, something to keep in mind is that sometimes you're not the right match for a company, and you are still you, and you might be the perfect match for a different company. Everything's contextual with respect to what individuals bring. Um, and then we had tools and technology, because the clients are like, and we need to know what your tools are and what technology you're using. And I'm like, well, I got to figure that one out. So we... I just came from a company that had wonderful technology, but I didn't have the technology. Um, so I had to go and buy some technology from a little developer that was going out of business um, that was at least rudimentary technology, so I, at least people would understand I didn't steal the technology. And then we just had to spend time kind of shoring it up and putting it together so I could answer the third T. And then, and then the track record, there was the handful of us that had um, ship titles that we could point to. So that was um, something we we're gonna have to generate super quickly, but at least we had the, the set of games that we could list that the team members had been involved in. But this was within um, April. So the first person I started paying was in April once we had this, because I had limited funds. <laughs> so I had to keep going. So one of the things I had learned, um, I don't know if I put this here, no, maybe later, is I, I remember at some point just thinking, there's just no halfway. Like, I just have to plunge in as if this is going to be successful, because there's no way I can just like put my toe into water. Is this going to work? Which is really kind of the approach I started April with, thinking it's like, oh, I might have this approach, but I didn't really have an all or nothing um, approach. So I did in April have to kind of shift and just embrace that, like, I got to proceed as if this is going to be successful, because otherwise I'm going to um, drag it down. So one of my weaknesses is um, when you think about the SWOT analysis, I know nothing about sales. I'm an engineer from RPI, I did research, I didn't ever have to do sales. And um, fortunately, Simon Balin, who used to run the 
incubator center twisted my arm to go to this training class. He had to persuade me because I had to pay like $1,000. It seemed like a huge amount to me at the time to be part of this training. Um, and he really, I, he got on the phone with a couple other people just to like browbeat me into um, doing this, which I thank him for because thank goodness, I mean, you forget to invest in yourself. So I did the sales training, which I definitely recommend to anybody, especially an engineer, to go through and do if you're in that um, position because I remember going through it and doing my little books and flying out to Los Angeles every month or so to visit clients. And I remember bringing my little book to work on this training stuff. And I remember on the plane, just having this aha moment there on the plane. I'm like, I get it. I have to do everything the opposite of the way I would do it normally. <laughs> With that insight, I was able to change my ways. By that I mean as an engineer technologist, I talk about the technology first. I love the technology, I love my solution. I go in and just tell them about this awesome technology I have. That's what I was trained to do. That's what I did for years. In, in sales, you don't do that. You wanna hear what their issue is, what they're looking for, and you try to avoid talking about what you're going to be doing because they don't really want to hear about the hammer if they don't have a nail. And so, um, so that, was, that was a great experience and just kind of reinforcing to just like go learn these things because uh, you know, some of your best instincts can be working against you. Um, and then another issue we had as a weakness is that we obviously we hired a bunch of RPI students and um, other people. Um, and we still tend to hire a lot of, we're one of the few studios that will hire entry level people because we put in a lot of processes to try to support learning. I find people can learn really fast if you have enough processes to allow them to make mistakes um, and recover from those mistakes. So as long as you have good processes and tools, um, a lot of people can you know, shine in that situation. But that was a big issue to begin with. Um, and, then, and then we have the weaknesses of the competition. Well, they, our competition still has a lot of weaknesses. Um, the trick is almost all of those could apply to us if we get our, keep our eye off the ball and we're not paying attention. A lot of these can happen and sometimes it has nothing to do with us, like projects can get canceled, delayed, and if it's your only income, you know, what is, what's the next thing you're going to be doing? And in, in my business, you don't really know um, six months ahead of time what you're gonna be doing next. You just have to keep um, jumping to the next thing. Um, let's see here. So my, the startup strategy was to build the team super quickly. Um, I was going to burn through my money very fast because I never ask anybody to work for free. Um, we had our health insurance plan still starts on June 1st um, because we had to get it going because people need health care. Um, and so we, we had enough people together that we could actually start it. So even to this day, we, we have our startup weird timing of, of health insurance uh, enrollment plan starting on June 1st. Um, we had uh, what I, uh, I compare to spring training. We just ran a project as if we were doing it for a client um, and um, use that to train up the team. But we also use that to have something we could show to those clients to say, this is what the team has done together. Like this is literally the team you'd be hiring. This is the quality to work. And it, it was pretty, it was a pretty awesome demo, but because we put all our time into it. And then, um, and then I just traveled a lot to the clients and showed up on their doorsteps. I'm not really sure how to do it now with remote stuff. It's really hard because their doorsteps aren't doorsteps anymore. But the, the, what I found always is that even, even something I learned at GE from my first boss there is that you just have to show up where your client is because they don't really want to schedule a meeting. Everybody's busy. But if you happen to be in town, people are usually willing to get together. And usually in those impromptu meetings are when you learn about opportunities that you would never have learned about. They just come out of that conversation um, and just getting to know what they're working on. And then since you're there, they're like, oh yeah, now I'm thinking of this, this other thing. So um, did a lot of that just going over, going to all the, visiting everybody that I knew over there, and they were very patient that let me show their, our demo, which I'm sure at some stages wasn't very impressive, but they were, they were polite. And then we just tried to, you know, tried to find other idealists that were trying to accomplish similar things and built our team and, you know, brought in some awesome people that really made the company what it became. Um, so that, that was our starting up, um, and then we, we had this, uh, this is our web page when we started out, um, because one of the things I realized is to find those idealists, we need to really be mission first, like Pixar, which I worked for before and was kind of like my role model company is Pixar when it was little. But, um, and so our web page didn't even show much about our games. And so clients would call me and like, oh yeah, you're the ones, you have like the pile of kids on the front page. And so our web page just talked about the mission 
and kids, and that differentiated us from the other people out there. So I think that was pretty effective. Also, it was great because I could make it by myself, and that was important. Um, like my first business card is like, you just have to do it yourself. So if you have lots of different talents, that's great. You'll never run out of things to do. And so we did a lot of great games for kids. There were, there were just some really fun adventures, um, mostly Nintendo DS. We only did two Game Boy Advance games. And one of them was just Disney trying to see if we could actually, you know, graduate to the, the big leagues of Nintendo DS. Go Pets was a license that we actually licensed ourselves. And then we went and found a publisher for it. So we tried a lot of different things here. Um, so what we got right, um, focus on quality, definitely Disney is still a client today, um, but they make games entirely different. They've gone through like 10 different versions of Disney games. Um, same thing with uh, Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. So, but they still have the attention to quality um, and they're still a great demanding client. It's great to work for a demanding client because they just raise your game to the, the highest bar. Um, educational game, we, the leapfrog relationship was great until it wasn't anymore. Um, in educational games, we did some really fun games that I think still stand up to the test of time. And the viability of the industry in upstate is definitely the case, right? That was worth investing in, is worth trying to advocate for and move that forward. Um, Oh, things I didn't get quite as well, or maybe this is kind of in between. I love innovation. Obviously, I'm a research person, I'm a technologist. I went to RPI, I love technology. Um, but the, the thing with technology, even though I can't resist doing technology, is that usually it's not, I guess I would say you have to pick the right time. Timing is everything. So we've done a lot of first ofs that um, somebody then would do later in a much more profitable way. So like we did a version of a AR game, which was basically very similar to what Pokemon Go does. Yeah, I think they were a lot more successful. But we, we had more fun because we didn't know what was possible yet. Um, we had downloadable content. So our, our Club Penguin game, you could actually download new levels, which was kind of unheard of at that time. We had to get special permission from Nintendo for that. In addition, in that game, we also allowed the pets to travel between the Nintendo DS and the PC version of the game also needed to get special permission from Nintendo. But that, that's a lot of fun for me as a technologist. It has no business benefit because um, it's before it's time. GoPets, which we licensed, which we loved, was a social networking game, but that didn't exist as a genre. So the challenge with that is trying to explain to everybody you're working with, your publisher, distributor, that no, it's not an adventure game. No, we don't have to add quests. It's actually a game where you just meet other people and send them gifts. <laughs> it was just unheard of. Um, but of course now, obviously, that's uh, where everything went. And that's why we love Club Penguin, because it was a, it's a, a, a social networking game for kids, whereas Go Pets was always a little iffy when it came to kids. Um, Things I didn't predict was research games. We Right now, we're doing four different research games in the fall when it's usually our quiet time, um, working with researchers for how to apply games to medical, different medical applications. So these are researchers at Yale, Stanford, um, UPMC, and, uh, and a small startup. So I, I never even conceived of this being a market by itself, but it's really one that, I wouldn't say it's super uh, large market, but it's one in very much need of developers because it's a hard audience to work for because you don't know what you're making while you're making it. You're iterating it even more than a regular game. And then also I didn't expect to be working for like Fiscal Ship, which is for voters. So that's for all ages to learn about policies that um, the Congress isn't deciding on that um, have to do with the federal budget. So that's a, that's a game that's not aimed at young kids at all, right? It's aimed at anybody who's a voter. And um, this game has been up for seven years. Wilson Center still um, updates the, um, and Brookings still update the um, policies. So they get the office management budget, given the policies. They have interns that entered all into the CMS that we made. That's a live CMS. And so the um, game is constantly getting updated and you should go play it because you'll learn something. Um, and then another market I didn't predict, I had all this focus on education and, um, and guess what market people would actually spend money on? Healthcare, <laughs> because the problem with educational games is like then you try to sell it and schools can't even have science labs. They don't even have foreign language programs, let alone have money to pay for software technology. And so, um, so healthcare is actually probably a faster adopter and healthcare has usually been a leader in technology regardless. There are a lot of really important 
problems to solve that change people's lives. We're doing an ER training simulation that will save lives. We have a, another game that we're working with that will forestall, they slow the onset of Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of really meaningful work that can be there, done there in terms of bringing the technology that the entertainment industry has kind of in, you know, created the engine to create and come over to that area. So that, that's something that wasn't even on my mind when um, First Playable started. It would have blown my mind if I even thought about it at that time. So anyway, so taking the plunge, uh, I was just trying to summarize the, the, the key um, um, success factors. Uh, one is just being very tolerant to risk because you never know what you're going to be working on next. You don't have very much um, advanced warning. You get, get used to that. So um, serendipity, you really can't predict. A lot of things, like even our LeapFrog relationship was just an email that I could have missed um, to our info at email address on our, our website um, that led to a very fruitful uh, relationship. So sometimes it's just um, serendipity. Um, certainly agility. You just have to change. You just have to you just have to, right now, we have all this debate about AI, and like, oh, you know, there's this and that. It's like, yes, but, you know, it's going to happen whether I like it or not. I have to figure out how to use it, how to make it, um, use it properly, how to make it something that we can um, incorporate into our business. And then, of course, perseverance, which I always say my PhD, the P stands for perseverance, as far as I can tell from my experience of that process, and just not giving up even when, you know, the worst things have happened and you just have to keep... You just have to keep going. And I think the combination of those, I like to use the little multiplication because all our equations at G had multiplications because if you had a zero in any of them, that would zero out the rest. But that's kind of my synopsis. Well, that. That's fantastic, Toby. <laughs> and like, you took the jump. 18 yes. years you're later, you're still here. And not only still here, but you're a model business within the industry. So still, that, that's, still that's really fantastic. Still around many years later. <laughs> um, I, I did get a bunch of phone buzzes on my phone, so that must mean people sent questions in. <laughs> but I did get one uh, during registration um, from Katie Farrell, class of 2010, and she asked, what was the biggest compromise that you had to make while starting your business, and what was that result, positive or negative? Hmm. Well, it's funny, because then you said when starting my business, but, um, but I was immediately thinking of a different um, thing. So, so I'll talk about the thing I was thinking about because I can't think of the answer to your other question. Um, one of the big compromises I had to make is that we started making HTML5 games. Um, so you guys, most of you are technologists. You probably can relate to just like fundamentally not liking a technology. I'm a C++ person, embedded system C++ person. There, I, I like nothing about HTML5. I definitely didn't want to do anything in that technology. I just thought it was going to be a waste of time. But we, we did have individuals in our company who were very excited about it. In the end, I'm still going to go with what people are excited about because that's what's going to make the difference. So if you have people on your staff who are super excited about something, even if it's not, you know, something I want to do. Um, so against my um, preferences and better judgment, I went along with the idea of doing HTML5 games. And that physical ship game is in HTML5. I mean, it does have a lot of power, and we've done a, a lot of games using that technology. It's still not my favorite technology, and I felt like it was a big compromise to be doing games that weren't C++ focused. So um, sometimes I've learned that the thing that I had the knee-jerk re reaction to is the biggest suspect thing. Like when I react too strongly against something, I'm like, there's something about it you're just biased about and you're probably wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> because I have that reaction. And that would be an example. So, I mean, speaking about that bias, and another question was, what's the biggest turnoff a startup can have? Well, it's a lot of work. Um, it's if so if you're passionate um if you if you're passionate about what you do which is the case with me no matter what job i've had um whether i was working for myself or working for other employers i i put everything into that because i care you know i'm one of those mission driven people but it's a lot of hours because um for instance remember i was talking about um the automatic boil detection that I was doing for GE. Um, so even though I was working for a big company, it was still affected everything because I'm a little obsessive about things. So the reason I bring it up is my daughter was asked around that a few years later, of like, what do your mom do at GE? And she's like, she boiled water. Because guess what I came when I was home? Guess what I was doing? I was boiling water on the stove to measure how fast it boiled in different types of pans and the whole, <laughs> the whole 
<laughs> the whole family was dragged into my boiling water project. So I think that's the challenge with a startup. It's not, it's not clock in, clock out. It's not a factory job. It's going to be, you know, and at some points of people's lives and some people that's fine. Um, and if it's not a good match, then it's not, it's not for you. Um, we have another one, I think, it, either from a student or a professor. As a PhD graduate, did you have any problems going from the classroom to the boardroom? And, uh, you know, mentioning, you know, you didn't have sales training. Would something like an MBA help, have helped you transition or any other additional experience be valuable? Yeah, I think an MBA um, could introduce you the, to those tools that I only learned because I happened um, serendipitously to be doing the Six Sigma for marketing hobby or side project that I picked up a G. And I did that because I was a researcher frustrated that I was doing all this work, but then it wasn't useful to the businesses. So I was really motivated to kind of um, pick up that and run with it. And so I think an MBA would introduce you those to, to those tools. If I hadn't had that experience, I wouldn't even know those tools. Um, existed. As far as the transition from a PhD, I got my PhD part-time while working full-time at GE. I slowed down a little bit when my daughter arrived partway through that. <laughs> so I also um, didn't take maternity leave. So I, was, uh, so I was already doing business while also doing my PhD. But I'll say the hardest thing in business as an engineer to deal with is things that aren't logical and they don't make sense, but they're going to be that way anyway. So um, I think especially if you're in the classroom and in a lot of our um, fields that we look at, there's a lot of logic and analytics, and it can be very frustrating when you have to deal with something that's completely illogical, but that's the way the person's going to do it, and usually they're your clients. So That's great. Um, there's a couple comments about the slides, uh, I guess, on, yes. on the phone. So, uh, we'll definitely uh, send those, but uh, you know, obviously, coming from a video game designer, that they were great this, this <laughs> evening. If you weren't able to see them, um, so you know, thank you, Toby, for you know this really great conversation yes. and your perspective. Um, you know, I'd like to also uh, thank everyone for attending this evening's program. Does anybody here have questions? Uh, some of them were from from the uh, from the audience, but uh, you know, if you want to answer a few, we can we can do that as well. So for those on the, on the webcast, the question was, uh, someone in northeastern uh, New York, uh, what, how did you make the connections in the LA Silicon Valley area for, for this industry? Yeah, and in that case, it's because I just worked at another small company and made the contacts through my presence in the industry. And in the industry, I was very active in the, in the um, conferences. Um, and I have my huge stacks of business cards um, from that. So I basically would, you know, scavenge all those network, all those contacts, um, and utilize them quite extensively. It's a whole different world now with LinkedIn, um, and I have a lot of old business cards I should throw out. But the other thing I would do, I actually had a little map of where all the offices were. Um, because there wasn't like GPS. <laughs> it's showing a lot of time. up at the doorstep again, right? <laughs> yeah, you're showing yeah. up at the doorstep to try to figure. It's like okay, um, because you have to learn your geography enough. Because I don't want them to feel like I went out there just for the meeting, um, because otherwise they wouldn't. It's too much of a social commitment to have somebody come out from New York State for a meeting. So yeah, just by being active and and trying to utilize those those connections. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about being passionate about what we're doing, and it looks like you did a very different career on, on, from the beginning from GE to that. And I, from what you told, it looks like you're not a gamer before doing those. So how, how that works for you? Well, in some ways, I think of GE as my additional graduate school. Maybe that's the equivalent of the master's, the MBA um, that other people have done. And then, um, yeah, I feel like it was a big change. However, it was funny, at a holiday, a family holiday once, my sisters were like, we always knew you would do that. I'm like, what do you mean? I never played video games. They're like, you always were trying to make us play board games with you all the time. And I did always make every chore into a game as a kid. So I think that playfulness and trying to see the world a different way, I think that was part of my personality. I just kind of stumbled into it a different way. Um, because it is true, because we had to clean up stuff I was always inventing. 
some game. Even at GE Research, I was coming up with like little games when we were doing stuff that, you know, I didn't want to do, just to make it more fun. But yeah. But. One more question. How you doing? Uh, Kevin Fletcher, class of uh, '93, masters and 2005 PhD and uh, currently professor of practice and undergraduate program director for the Lally School of Management. Um, love to hear you talk a little bit about your experience with the B Corp process mm. and whether that's kind of changed the organization in any way or was it kind of, kind of baked into the organization and it made more sense to do it? Yeah, the B Corp um, component, when I first started the company at the, um, at the incubator, I remember talking to the staff there because I'm like, oh, I'm going to like, but I'm going to do this company. It's going to be for the community. And I remember um, Tammy, I forget her last name now. She's like, oh, there's a word for it. It's social entrepreneurship. So she like kind of introduced me to the idea that this was a concept. Um, I think I'm just a very idealistic person in my previous corporate experience and experience with boards. I think somebody asked about the boardroom. Um, I was being told a lot that I was naive, idealistic. I didn't understand how business was done. I, was, I heard that a lot from people. So of course, when I start my own company, I'm just like, I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to prove that I can be as idealistic as, as I want and still make a company successful. So the social entrepreneurship was great. And I had these kind of guidelines and things that I was trying to do. But generally, it just sounded like, just like general do-goodery stuff. And so when I first heard about the B Corporation, um, both the corporate entity that exists and just the movement of B Corporation, which is the movement of um, companies that when they're incorporated, that they exist not just for shareholder profit, but also for stakeholder benefit. And it's actually in your operating rules because of course your investor would want to know that you're no longer there only to maximize profit, which is the, the legal responsibility of most companies is to maximize um, profit of their shareholder. I'm the only shareholder, so you can have a, just a benevolent shareholder and it doesn't matter. But it was really started by Ben and Jerry um, because when they sold their company to Unilever, they were forced to take the highest price even though they felt that it was a horrible match for their company. So that, that's where the B Corporation initiative came from. So when I heard about it, I'm like, that's amazing. It has a name. There's other people trying to do it. And now it gives me credibility. It also gives me a better way to communicate to my, my clients and my employees, like what are goals there. And this is why we're composting. And this is why we, you know, don't take the elevator. <laughs> this is why we do all these. This is why we never buy anything new. We have used furniture and everything else we, um, we do. So that was great. And when we became certified, that was a great process. It was great for the employees to contribute to um, and, you know, get involved in and think about how we could, like, you know, include things like the payment between what the CEO is getting paid versus your lowest paid staff member and all kinds of equity and other considerations. Um, currently, we haven't kept up our certification because it's so much paperwork, and right now we're a tiny office, so since uh, COVID started, we're not in a good position to, you know, try to actually... because. Obviously, the thing that they're facing is then everybody wants to say they're a B corporation, but are they really? Like, do you, like, for instance, we would only um, get food for our office from, from the, the restaurants in Troy. You know, we actually do all those processes, but companies could try to, you know, greenwash or whitewash and say they're a B corporation without actually following the processes, which meant that the process has gotten quite extensive in terms of the amount that you have to. Um, the bookkeeping and everything you have to do to um, try to do that in terms of your vendors and dollars and things like that. So uh, when we have an office manager again, <laughs> hopefully we'll get back to that. But but it was pretty, it's huge and we still use that because I still um, believe that's fundamentally um, the way that um, business um, it has kind of been the way the lifeblood of the economy worked and I, I do feel like that it's really important to communities to have businesses that have that approach. And Yancy Stickler, who's the founder of Kickstarter, has um, some great talks and has kind of joined that movement and they and Kickstarter itself became a B corporation in terms of trying to get away from the um, just the um, 
attitude of financial maximization is the way he phrases it. The idea that financial maximization will result is good is, is kind of a fallacy, but so much, of our, um, so much of our economy and industry and venture runs on this idea that making money by itself will result in good things happening. It's just not, I just don't believe it's true. So I love to see other people joining that and adding some voice to it. And so we always buy from B corporations if we can, you know, it's a great network and we still try to uphold all those principles because why else, um, you know, the other way I phrase it is like, you know, a company should exist for the benefit of people, not the other way around. Um, and, you know, it's hard, it's hard leading a company doing that because they're always on the edge of, you know, survival because you're trying to, you know, favor your employees and your clients and everything else, but hopefully you can make a bigger difference in the time you have, even if you're not making a big pile of money. You can tell I could talk about that forever. All right. we, have, we have one last question here on the, on the left side. Thank you. Hi, I'm Adrian. I'm an MBA student uh, currently creating a startup. And my big question was, how has company culture changed from when you began and where you are now? And how did you go about that change? Um, that's a great question because a company is really, um, I know in a big corporation people are viewed as replaceable and they sort of need to be in a large corporation. You all need to be nice round pegs that will fit in different holes so <laughs> they can re reorganize a group. In a small company, um, your company is totally defined by the people who are in that company at that time. So we, we just had some amazing people that created that culture. Um, one thing that I find challenging right now is that so much of our culture was based around um, co-located, being co-located in the space. And we have so many people who are remote and with COVID, I don't think that that's gonna change anytime soon. So things like having a celebration, all going down to get an ice cream cone, um, or having a Nerf gun battle that broke up the whole afternoon because you're running around, or shipping parties, where you go do something like, we, we can do parties now, but they involve playing games online, which is really kind of what we do for our day job. Um, whereas we used to do shipping parties where we'd go play laser tag, you know, and just like run around and try not to, you know, run into pointy objects. But, um, so that's really hard to figure out how to bring back into the culture because that created, you know, just kind of that fun, um, spontaneous culture that I believe really built relationships. We have a really strong alumni network out there that still gets together. We have like the, the first playable alumni in the, in the Los Angeles area that, you know, get together for um, just things like that. So it's hard to think about how to replace that. Um, or how to still make it happen. Because we have a small on-site team, but it's still sometimes weird. It's like, well, we're gonna go get some ice cream and like everybody else like, in your home, I don't know, do Send something Venmo, fun. Right, to, do, to go and Yeah, do ice like cream some themselves. people have done like Uber Eats or something. It's still just not the same. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. So that's, that's my big cultural puzzle. But a lot of times what I did try to do with respect to culture is just that it had to do with community service because we always tried to encourage people taking time for community service and we hired people based on their community service interest. And very early on in the first um, few months, I just had to think is like, the way we can't wait until we're successful to be a certain way. We just have to start out being the way we want to be um, because otherwise that time will never come. And then you'll find out that you've, uh, you know, tried to save this or you didn't do this because you're waiting until you were successful enough. And to be honest, it's because I was so busy with my volunteer commitments. I'm like, I'm supposed to be 100% of my business, but I'm still doing this Montessori school stuff. Um, how many hours a day? So. <laughs> well. Toby, you know, thanks again, and you know, we're going to transition to uh, opportunity to network over snacks and refreshments yes, for those here uh, in the building. But for those that are attending virtually, that conversation doesn't have to stop. So just a reminder to leverage our RAA Connect platform to continue as a community to stay together, and and that's again accessible through our alumni website. So again, have a have and a we have really, two more of these, right? You we have do. Two more this of these? is the first one, and uh, more information is going to be shared about uh, the second event, um, hopefully scheduled early uh, uh, next year. So, and um, stay tuned. Also, uh, that information is going to be on the RA Connect platform. So, uh, thanks everyone. Thank you, Toby, and have thanks. a great evening.